Thanks for listening to the Media People Podcast, lively and insightful chats with the people who power the media industry. I'm your host, Victor Genova. For more episodes, you can go to soundcloud.com slash media people podcast, or you can subscribe on your favorite podcast service like Apple Podcasts or CastBox. Views expressed by participants are personal. In today's episode, we get a peek into the life of a musician from the local music scene. Francesco Alfano, the founder and one-third of the rock trio Lucid Movement, stops by to chat about life as an artist in a digital world. We'll also get the chance to listen to one of Lucid Movement's tracks, Next Thing. And if you like what you hear, then be sure to check out Lucid Movement in person at their next show on May 20th in Toronto at Club 120. Tickets are available now at the band's website, www.lucidmovementband.com. Francesco, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Victor. This is the first musician I've ever had. I'm really excited about this. Let's start first with the name of your band, uh, Lucid Movement. Where does that come from? Ah, thanks. No pressure being the only musician on your show. Uh, Lucid Movement. Well, I'm a psychedelic person by nature, you know, 60s, 70s rock. And I, I, it's, it's harder to find a band name than to write a song, believe it or not. You know, so I threw around names for a while and that one kind of stuck. It's simple, lucid movement, very short syllables and uh, just invoking in the feelings of a movement really, you know, and it's a vivid and it's coherent and trying to get a point across. So I figured that name had a good catch to it. And so who makes up the band? Cause you guys correct me if I'm wrong. You're a rock and roll trio. Yeah, we're a rock and roll trio. I make up the band and different players come and go. Uh, right now I'm playing with two really great players, Ben and Will. They, they go to George Brown for music. They're super talented, and um, this is the second iteration of this project. I, I had a previous trio, and we played around for two years, and people sometimes lose interest, get involved with other projects, so change of personnel, but the music remains constant. So everything carries on with you then, more or less? Pretty much, yeah. Okay, so let's go back to the beginning. Where are you from? From Toronto. Born and raised? Yeah, North York. I mean, I guess that counts. And so was music always part of your life growing up? I think probably grade seven. I remember I was in an elementary school band and the music teacher stuck me with the flute. <laughs> I hated it. So I, I, I told my parents, you know, I don't want to play the flute. I want to play the, I want to play the alto sax. And from grade seven to grade 12, I played alto sax. Really? So you started off in the woodwinds because usually yeah. a lot of band members start with, like I say, a concert pitch instrument like the piano so they could read both clefs yeah. or the guitar but no you started with the woodwinds yeah i did did you have any sort of musical inspirations during that time it was it's interesting because for, in that time when i was playing saxophone i remember alternative music was just kicking ass and just felt like it resonated with me are we lot. going back to the 90s here yeah you know like that's i think i read somewhere that you don't find music that appeals to you after a certain age. I think it might be 20, <laughs> you know, so everything that you love is built on everything before that. So what was it about alternative music? Was it the music itself, the bands, the lyrics, everything, you know, I feel like the songwriting was very underrated in the nineties. People had a lot to say and it wasn't, it wasn't as fluff and just the aggression that was present. I, I, I think I had a lot of angst growing up. So Hearing stuff that aggressive on the radio really fueled me. Outside of the alto sax, uh, you're also the guitarist for your band. Are there any other instruments that you play? I can get around on the bass pretty well. I've, I've done a lot of demoing on my own tracks where I'll, I'll play guitar and then I'll play bass and maybe lay down a piano and use use some loops, some drum loops to fill it in. You just mix it all together from there? Yeah, I just mix it in. Apart from your alto sax and your flute lessons, which I know you're reluctant to talk about. I don't want to talk about that. Do you want to talk about that? <laughs> Did you have any sort of... Uh, formal music lessons or did you were you self-taught from the guitar onwards there was some attempt at music lessons when i was in school when i was playing the saxophone but none of that really stuck um and in terms of guitar a lot of self-teaching youtube uh, meeting friends of mine that were really talented uh, playing shows with other artists observing self-taught is probably Probably accurate for guitar. YouTube's very good for those sort of things. Oh, yeah. Watching old dudes, old dudes in their boxers showing you Sweet Home Alabama. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, so let's go back to that. You mentioned Leonard Skinner right there. So who is your favorite musician or what is your favorite band? Like if you could put on one CD, if I can say that, if people still put on CDs, what would you grab? I really love John Lennon. You know, his solo work after the Beatles, it's just, it's so dark, you know, and his songwriting is so, it's so defined, you know, so... He's probably my favorite artist of all time, I would say. Really? What about during the 90s? You mentioned Alternative being a very big influence for you. Was there a yeah. certain band that stuck out then? Uh, the 90s. I mean, Soundgarden. Soundgarden's always it's always yeah. been tops for me. Since I heard them the first time until their most recent work, I, I'm just crazy for them. Even Chris Cornell posts Soundgarden oh, as yeah. well. Yeah. His last album that he has out, I think it's called, uh, oh shit, it might be called Higher Truth or something. But he's got some really good ballads on there, and his voice is just phenomenal to me uh you know my name the casino royale song he did oh yeah best bond song hands down you can't go back better that. than live and let die yes better than live and let wow, die better man. than what duran duran put together <laughs> no no that's not, not duran duran live and let die though wow okay yes okay chris cornell all the way yeah he's the shit how did lucid movement form you mentioned that you've kind of rotated through uh the bassist and the drummer as you go through but where did the actual start of the band come from prior to being I guess the leader of this band, I was in another band. I started it with a friend of mine at the time who was a songwriter and I was a scratch guitar player at best. And he convinced me into being in this duo where we kind of had, uh, I don't know, he would write lyrics. I'd come up with arrangements and we'd work out the music. So we did that for about three years and we, we had different versions of bands. We recorded an EP we had we gig pretty much every bar in the city, so Rivoli, the Horseshoe, go down the list. Uh, but unfortunately, the dynamic there wasn't ever right. You know, some some singers or leaders of bands they let the ego get to them and they mistreat other people. And I just didn't want to be a part of something like that. So what I ended up doing was I basically scrapped all the work that I did with that project for three years. And started at net zero and started writing all of my own material from that point. So I guess you could say Lucid Movement started when I quit the other project that I was in. You have a number of original songs on your SoundCloud account. What's the original uh, songwriting process like for the band? Like, not just where you get your inspiration, but, you know, when do you do your writing? Things like that. When do these things come to you? Does mm-hmm. it come to you in pieces? Or do you just sit down and put yourself into it for about three or four hours? I write all the material, so I'll, I'll write all the arrangements, write all the lyrics, and then I'll bring a, a fully formed idea to my band, you know, and uh, the process, it's an ever-evolving <laughs> process, really. I mean, sometimes I'll have a, a, a riff that's just sitting around my brain for three years and never gets used. Other times it comes together in an afternoon. It, it's It's all a matter of just allowing yourself the opportunity to be inspired. And I find I write best when I have something to say. So if if I'm very upset, then I'll have stuff to say. If I'm very happy, maybe likewise. But uh, it's just a matter of finding the inspiration anywhere you can and allowing it to come out of you. And during the songwriting process, what comes to you first? Is it the melody or the lyrics? Probably the melody. I, I start everything on guitar. So I'll sit down with the guitar and, and I'll mess around and I'll find a cool little riff and go, how, do, how, how can I extrapolate on that? And that initial inspiration is what the whole song gets built off. And then I'll try to find subject matters that really work with the music. So you look at that and go, this feels like a happier beat. You know, I need a song that takes me to a happier place. Or if it's something possibly a little darker, you'll dig a little bit deeper for something like that. Exactly. Okay, let's talk about the production and distribution process of music because we go back 20 years to uh, the alternative era that you and I were speaking about, and it was all about CDs. But then along came something called the MP3 and Napster, and we know how that story goes. On one hand, it's made it easier, arguably, for bands, independent bands, to get themselves published and get out there. But on the other hand, too, there's just so much out there. So how do you stand out from the crowd? How do you promote yourself? Like what really works for you when it comes to getting gigs and getting people interested in your music? Just being authentic, you know, putting your vulnerabilities out there. I can't tell you how many bands I've played with and they're not saying anything. They're not feeling anything, you know, whereas I, I speak truthfully from, 
from my heart, you know? So if you read through my subject matter, my lyrics, it's all very real stuff and it's all real life experiences that I'm, I'm speaking about. So I think that's one way of separating yourself. And in terms of how do you get shows? How do you get out there? How do you do it? It's all about selling yourself. You are your own business in a sense, you know? So I have friends of mine that are promoters. I, I'll call them up and I'll say, Hey, do you have a show we can get onto? And we get onto it. And there's a certain expectation on our end. You have to be there at a certain time. You have a certain set time that you play. You have a certain amount of time that you're allotted. You need to bring a certain amount of crowd out. So it's, it's really treating everything like a business. If they tell you to be there at seven, you show up at seven and that, that, that works generally. That's an interesting point that you brought up here that I, I had never heard of before, that you're responsible for bringing the crowd as well. Yeah. So they don't just judge you on how great of a show you put on and what kind of music. It's how no. many people. Yeah, I mean, I'll give you a perfect example. You could probably get a gig at the Horseshoe on a Friday if for sure you could bring out 200 people. Having never really played anywhere, if they know you're going to bring out that many people, 200 times beer sales, you know, door, all of that. That's all they care about. They don't care about the music. All they care about is the money that they're going to make at the end of the night. Interesting. And let's talk a bit about some of the promotional work you do to get people out to your shows. Uh, on your website, lucidmovementband.com, you've got links to Facebook, Instagram, Twitter accounts. Does social media work for you? Is that a big part of what you do to bring people to your shows? And if so, which one of those platforms works best for you? I think it's it's an all-encompassing approach you know so the social is there for for people that maybe saw you at the gig and want to follow up you can you can build an audience through that also getting out and performing is that's the best way of doing it i find you know people are always going to judge you based on what they see so it's it's an all-rounded approach i mean each platform offers something a little different i think right now i'm really more into the instagram to be honest with you it's 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 less personal where I don't have to give them a credit card or like my personal information. It's just more sharing with your audience. That's interesting because Instagram is the, the one complaint about Instagram is, is that you only get one link in your bio and that's it. So you, when you post a photo, you can't link to say if you put a new track on SoundCloud just like that. So right. you find that that's working best for yeah, you. Yeah, I mean, I think people in today's day have gotten so tired of being sold to that they see through your approach. You know, if you post a... Uh, a little video saying, go buy my song. People are like, man, stop fucking spamming my Instagram account. You know, So I, I think it's better to just build an audience that trusts you and you post something that's thought-provoking and, and they digest it. And you're not trying to sell them anything. You're just, you're just there with them. And if they're interested, then they'll come to the show and they'll look at you and they'll follow up. Well, speaking of shows, when is your next one? Yeah, so my, our next show is May the 20th. We're playing at Club 120, which is on Church Street and Richmond Street. And if anyone wants tickets, where can they go to get them? You can go to our website at www.lucidmovementband.com. So we've got one of your tracks that we're going to play for everyone right now. This one's called Next Thing. Can you give us a bit of an intro to the song before we go into it? It's a song that speaks to perseverance, really, um, you can get knocked down, but you'll, you'll still be there at the end of it all.
As I mentioned earlier, you've got a number of different songs on SoundCloud that you've um, written, recorded, and produced. But what I find interesting is that Next Thing is kind of the lead song on uh, your website. Why did you pick that one? I picked that one because it, it, it encapsulates a lot of our sound. You know, there's, there's a lot of melody, but it gets very aggressive at times. And um, there's a lot of energy there. So I, I felt like that would be a good first foray to have people listen to us and see what we sound like. I'm a child of the 80s, but I really didn't discover music until the 90s when I could afford to buy my own CDs. And I heard many alternative influences in Next Thing. If I had to pick a band or two that I heard in this song, I'd have to say that the band Bush or even David Usher and some of his early works uh, from Moist. I love both of them. Both, both really <laughs> yeah. good bands from the 90s. Yeah, alternative music. It just there's, there's something about the raw emotion that it, it just... You know, it just really gets to me. I love it. It doesn't matter when I hear it. It just always resonates with me really well. And you couldn't really keep a lot of those people down during that era because, I mean, we have Nirvana. Uh, Foo Fighters emerged from that. Right. There was even that time when Red Hot Chili Peppers and Jane's Addiction were, sh were sharing band members oh, as yeah, well. Exactly. So it seems like those people were playing for the love of it, and they just kind of kept coming back, even if the band collapsed for them. Yeah, exactly. I, I feel like that was one of the the last true forms of music. Um, I know music is always evolving and, you know, electronic music, I love it. I mean, I, I, I dabble in that as well, but I just, there's something lacking compared to when you go watch an, a band perform, you know, and there's three people with instruments all doing something live and, and it's almost like you're on a tightrope, you know, they might fall off at any moment and there's something really exciting about that. And how often do you guys rehearse then? Because one thing I've noticed about a lot of bands is that, they may sound great in the recording or in production, but they don't sound great on stage. Mm -hmm. Something's just off. So how do you guys go about combating that? Uh, well, Because there's think, always going to be a difference between live yeah. and recorded. It's just experience, really. And also knowing, you know, having done this, uh, I've been in bands for about seven years now. So you learn, you can really do something crazy in the studio, but unless you can do that live, it's false advertising. So our, our approach and my approach specifically is I write and record to sound like I would at the gig. So even though next thing has a, a bunch of tracks and a lot of string arrangements in there, the lead guitar line is present. The guitars are there, the solos, all that stuff is all live. And that's a live track pretty much. Francesco, thank you so much for this. One more time before we go, uh, throw to your show. Where can people get tickets? When's it happening and where? Yeah, so May 20th, Club 120. You can get tickets at our website, lucidmovementband.com. Awesome. Thanks a lot for your time. Appreciate this. This much, was fun. Man. Thank you. That's it for today's show. For more episodes, you can go to soundcloud.com slash media people podcast or subscribe on your favorite podcast service like Apple Podcasts or CastBox. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Vic Genova.